Hello health champions. Everybody wants to lose fat fast. They want to drop the weight quickly. And exercise is certainly a good add-on to make that happen. But which is better? Should you do a high intensity interval training or should you do a steady state cardio? Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. So first of all, I want to remind everybody why we really exercise. It's for brain activation, for hormone balance, improved circulation, anti-aging benefits, better balance, physical fitness, coordination, better quality of life overall, and as we're going to talk about in this video, of course, fat burning. Now, some people would put calories on that list, but that's just kind of so silly, we're just going to cross them off and talk about the stuff that really matters. What do we mean when we talk about HIT versus cardio? HIT is high intensity interval training. And high intensity means you get your heart rate up above 90% of your maximum. If you're not really fit, you don't want to start there. You want to work your way up to that. And interval training simply means we have short bursts of intense activity mixed with periods of rest and recovery. And when the intensity is that high, then we can only keep it up for seconds. People often mean the same thing when they talk about cardio or aerobics. And what this means is we have a medium intensity. It is a lot lower than the 90%, somewhere around 70%, give or take. Some people can push it up a little bit more. And oftentimes we talk about cardio as a steady state. So if you did something like a spin class, even though you might have variations, you might have higher or lower intensity within the workout, you're not having longer periods of complete recovery like we do in the high intensity. And because it is a lower intensity or a medium intensity, we can keep it up longer. This one, we just would fall down if we try to go longer than seconds, but here we can actually keep it up for 30 to 60 minutes. So which one is better for fat loss? Well, it depends. Let's first understand what's happening at different levels of exercise. So if you're 40 years old, as an example, then your maximum heart rate would be 220 minus your age or 180. So then you just put in whatever age you have and you come up with a number. And that's a good rule of thumb. It's not going to be exact. You might be 10 or 15 or 20 points higher or lower, but it'll give you a good idea. Then your heart rate, your full range of possible heart rates would be all the way from resting up to maximum heart rate. And you would be on a continuum from aerobic to anaerobic. And aerobic means that you are doing the exercise with air, that your breathing and the oxygen provided is enough to completely burn the fuel and provide energy for the activity. When you have a more intense activity, then the oxygen is no longer enough. You can't breathe fast enough to supply all of the energy needed and then you switch into the anaerobic range. And this is where it's really kind of ironic that people call it aerobics, but in effect it's anaerobic. So the thing that we refer to as steady state cardio or aerobics, we don't really think that we're working out until we get into that range where we're huffing and puffing. We go to class and we warm up and we think it starts, that it starts having effect when we start getting tired and panting and sweating. And by that time, we're not doing aerobics anymore. We have switched, right? And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. We'll, we'll talk about the different nuances, but just remember that aerobics are not aerobic. So what are some examples of these 
different activity levels. Well, aerobic activity would include walking and slow biking and rollerblading. So as long as you did these at a moderate pace without huffing and puffing, they would be purely aerobic. But you could also do any of these at a faster pace. So if you push yourself and you walk faster or bike faster, now you could turn them into an anaerobe activity. And also anything that you typically go to a class for, like a step class or a spin class, etc., those would qualify for anaerobic most of the time because you're probably going to get into the huffing and puffing when you do them. Also, any competitive sport, any team sport where you keep it up for 30, 60, 90 minutes would also be in the anaerobic range primarily. And hit high intensity interval training are things like sprints or running up the stairs in a stadium or doing burpees, activities that you couldn't keep up very long at all. Next, we want to understand the two sources of fuel the body has and how they change depending on activity. If you do a low intensity aerobic activity, you'll be using mostly fat. And that's especially true if you're fat adapted. If you are carb dependent or if you recently had a lot of starch or sugar, then you're going to shift that balance toward the glucose, but an aerobic activity is still primarily a fat burning activity. Now, once we get into cardio or aerobics, which like we said, are actually anaerobic, things are going to change. But sometimes we're a little sloppy with language and we say that the body switches from burning fat to burning carbs. And that's not really what happens because we're still going to maintain our basic aerobic fuel burning, all right? But once we get up to our aerobic threshold, once we get up to the limit that we can supply with oxygen, it doesn't mean that we stop using our aerobic base. It just means that we have to add another fuel source. So now we still burn the fat, but we have to burn more glucose in addition. So glucose becomes the dominant fuel. And the same thing obviously holds true for high intensity interval training, that the more intense it is, the more glucose we have to add on, the faster we have to burn through the glucose. So that glucose becomes even more dominant, but fat is still there as the aerobic base. The next really important key to understand is that the type of exercise will impact the hormones and hormones impact fat burning or fat storing. And the two hormones in question are human growth hormone and cortisol. And we think of human growth hormone as something good and cortisol as something bad in this context. Now, both of them obviously are produced at the right time in the right amount, but we want to find something that maximizes the benefits. So when we do aerobic training, then there is a small impact, not much, but it's more than if you're sitting on the couch. Then the more intense the exercise becomes, the more growth hormone we make. So anaerobic training, when you push yourself, when you get tired and you sweat, there is more potential for fitness. There is more challenge to the body, but with high intensity, when you push your limits, then the growth hormone goes through the roof. You can make as much as 700% more growth hormone from even short bursts of high intensity training. And what happens to the cortisol? Well, it also goes up accordingly, but with aerobic training, there is very little need to make more cortisol because the energy is provided from oxygen and burning fat. So we don't have to have more blood sugar to support this activity. So therefore there's a very, very small amount of cortisol produced. But as soon as we cross into that anaerobic range, we need another fuel source and the body has to start making more blood sugar. And obviously with HIT, then we're going to make even more because we're burning through that glucose even faster. But here's the key to understand that the high intensity interval training is 
such short bursts of activity that we might only keep it up for two to three minutes. Even if the workout lasts five or 10 or 15 minutes, the intense bursts only add up to about two to three minutes. So when we multiply that by the time, the total impact is actually very small. On the other hand, this size arrow has to be multiplied by the 30, 40 minutes or more that we sustain that activity. And during that longer time, we actually make a whole bunch of cortisol and the adrenals have to work really hard because it's a long time to do that. So if you understand this correctly, then you see that we want to optimize the human growth hormone and minimize the cortisol. So both the high intensity and the aerobic training does that, but the anaerobic sustained activity doesn't do that. So whether we do this for health benefits or whether we do it for fat burning, the outcome is the same. But it's also going to depend on who does this. It's going to be more or less beneficial or detrimental depending on who you are. So in scenario number one, we have a 40 year old guy and I keep the 40 years just because he keeps my numbers the same, but you can change it out depending on your age. So let's say this is a lean person. He's fit. He's been working out all of his life. He played sports in college and he never stopped keeping in shape. He has healthy adrenals. He doesn't eat junk food. He takes good care of himself. And he probably doesn't have a whole lot of fat to lose, but he's got a little bit extra because he hasn't been totally perfect and his goals are health and fitness and to get a six pack by summer. Now, the thing to understand about this person is that he or she has a high adaptability, a high limit, a high reserve. So that means you can push this body quite a bit without exceeding any limits, without breaking anything down. So if this person wanted to do some aerobic training and anaerobic training and some high intensity training to add on some growth hormone, they could fit all of that in and not exceed capacity, not to break the body down. They still want to be smart and have some periods of recovery, obviously, but if they wanted to do anaerobic training, if they want to do spin class or play tennis or whatever three times a week, then they can do that and still stay healthy and still maintain a healthy metabolism. But in another scenario, if we look at someone who's the same age, but they have a good amount of belly fat, they did not keep in shape for the last 20 years, but instead they watched TV and played video games and ate junk food and worked on their career and drank a lot of coffee. So now they have worn out their adrenals a bit. This is a completely different situation and, and the goals are probably going to be different. They're probably looking primarily for weight loss, and fat loss and hopefully if they've been watching this channel enough they're also including health as a goal in itself primarily rather than just weight loss and fat loss but this person in contrast has a low level of adaptability their body can't handle that much they have low limits and low reserves so the activity that the first person was fine with it would break through the limits. It would exceed threshold of what's healthy and they would start breaking their body down instead. Therefore, this person would want to focus on aerobic activity. They could do as much or more aerobic activity, low level activity. Remember, no huffing and puffing. They could do that three to five times a week for as long as they wanted to, 60 to 90 minutes still obviously within the levels of their fitness. If you haven't moved in years, you may not want to go on a 90 minute hike every day. You work up to it. They also want to do some high intensity interval training. But again, if you're not fit, you don't want to start trying to push your body up to 180. You still are going to be in a high intensity at a lower level but you do it twice a week for just a few minutes and as you get more fit, you gradually push this level of high intensity up toward your maximum. 
And if you really, really love some sort of sport, some sort of anaerobic activity, you can probably fit it in, but I would keep it at an easier level and I wouldn't do it more than once a week for maybe 20 minutes, right? And these are not hard and fast rules, but I'm trying to give you the idea that what's healthy for one person is not going to be healthy for another. So what about the ever popular boot camp? All the people who they find themselves in middle age and they haven't been taking care of themselves and now all of a sudden they're going to fix everything in a short period of time. So they go to the gym and they sign up for boot camp and they get a personal trainer who's going to try to whip them into shape. And this is not the right solution because typically that boot camp is going to put them all into the anaerobic activity and they're going to stress their body more than what is good for it and they're going to actually start breaking their body down. What about the fat burning? Well, in both high intensity and cardio, you'll probably burn similar amounts of fat during the exercise. You might even burn more in the cardio because it has longer duration. But what's more important is to understand how does this affect you long term? What's happening in the days after the workout. So with high intensity interval training, you're getting a boost in growth hormone that even though the boost may not stay super high for days, it still has positive impacts on your body for days after. Increasing metabolism, increasing fat burning, and because you control the cortisol, because the duration is so short, you're going to have limited cortisol and limited insulin responses. You're not going to push either one of these up and you're going to be working your body in a way that allows it more health, more balance, more homeostasis. You're not going to push it in a way that it can't find its way back to balance. And what happens with cardio in the days after? Well, if you're healthy, like scenario one, then yes, you can still stay in a healthy state of fat burning. It probably won't be optimal. You can probably still get better benefits by focusing more on high intensity and low level and do less of the cardio, but you can still get away with it. You can still be healthy. However, if you have insulin resistance and you have weak adrenals, now you're going to be pushing the cortisol beyond what you can handle. You're going to create insulin resistance. You're going to probably add to the belly fat that you already have and you'll be pushing your body away from health. You'll be decreasing health and you could even affect your fat burning in a negative way. So hopefully by now you're looking for fat loss, health, fitness and good hormones all together. And then you want to focus on aerobic. You want to do the vast majority hours over here and seconds to a few minutes over here. And then if you're also fit and you have high reserves and you have some sport or event and you just love to do it, then add in a little bit of aerobics as well. But still I would put most of my emphasis on aerobic and HIIT because in my opinion, in my experience, then you're looking for this and you want to maximize growth hormone and minimize cortisol. Another way of thinking about exercise and what's really natural for us is to watch kids and dogs, right? They're going to go running as fast as they can to pick up something, you throw them a ball and they run as fast as they can and they run back with it and you throw it again and they run as fast as they can and they come back. And then what happens when they're tired is they stop. You throw the ball and they're not interested anymore. Same thing with the kid. They're going to go run and say, hey, look how fast I can go. But they'll only do it as long as it's fun. They're not going to get on a track and go 45 minutes around the track. They might say, hey, look what I can do just like dad, but after two minutes they're tired and they stop. So that's how exercise should be. It should be play. It should be fun. And we're designed to 
go intense and then stop and rest. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to learn more about health and how the body really works, make sure you check out that video next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.